Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only had to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Hope you are doing good and that you are ready for the 87th episode of the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I want to start it off this episode by asking the question, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a little overrated, 10 to being very overrated, how overrated is Hamilton? I'm just kidding. We're not talking about that. I just had that on my mind. I thought it was perfectly fine. I had no problems with it. and I'm just really happy I didn't spend $300 to go see it. And I have the sneaking suspicion that me poking a little bit of fun at the cultural phenomenon that is the musical Hamilton isn't going to agitate or bother much of my listening base at all. So I hope that you're doing well. Uh, this is being recorded in the early July of 2020. So we have a few exciting things aside from Broadway musicals being released on Disney Plus to talk about, but that is not why you tune in, not for my riveting cultural or uh, entertainment commentary. It's fly fishing. So I'm going to actually talk today about what I am doing, and that is in the next couple of days, packing to go on vacation, quote unquote. So my wife and I actually had a conversation. Um, If you are going somewhere with all four of your children, it's vacation with a lowercase v. Now, I love my children. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely adore them. They are blessings. I thank God every day for all four of them. But it's a family trip. Let's just call it that. It's a family trip. And if you have ever been on a family trip and you want to go fishing, you know that it is a very, very delicate dance. Now, I am incredibly blessed in that I have a wife who is more than gracious, more than tolerant. And I think she also knows that I'm a much more pleasant person if I can get out of the house uh, a few times or wherever we're staying over the course of the week. And if I just so happen to have a fly rod with me, then that is two birds with one stone. And I have to also say that I've gotten to the point where my two older boys, eight and five, they're the ones that you probably heard on the podcast back on episode 50. They are excited. I think episode 100, which is maybe three months away, I guess, I think the boys will come back on and uh, you'll get to hear them again. But they fish now also, and they have gotten to the point, I think we went out on Saturday morning uh, a few days ago, and they were incredibly self-sufficient. It was amazing. It's this kind of like golden period where they really want to do everything I do, but they're able to do it on their own. It's wonderful, and I want to continue to foster this. And so there's nothing like a a week or 10 days away where you're able to do that with your family. So I... I'm going to talk in this this podcast about what that looks like, specifically packing. You're not going on a fishing trip. You're going on a trip that might have some fishing involved in it. And what does that look like? What are some ways you can prepare? Now, this might be one of those things that you're like, I've got this. This is easy. I, I, I do this all the time. I've got this nailed down. I want to know how to catch bigger fish, more fish, different fish. You know, I want you to regale me with one of your wonderful fly fishing stories or whatever you tune into casting across to, to get. But stick with me because maybe I do something a little bit different than you that you might say, oh, wow, that's actually good. That can save me some space. That can be a little bit more efficient. 
And I would say, uh, if you have any ideas, and I always say this at the end of the podcast, if you have any ideas of how you pack and how you prepare for going on fishing trips when you are not actually going on a fishing trip, then let me know. Uh, Matthew at castingacross.com or chirp me on Facebook or Twitter or just leave a comment at the bottom of the show notes for this podcast's post on castingacross.com. So the first thing is the most important thing is you're going to need your rod. Now, this might be tricky where if you're going on a fishing trip, like the last big trip I went on, it was for Brookies up in Maine, I think. And I think I brought four fly rods because I could, because it was just me going on a fishing trip. And so I brought two six weights and a five weight and a four weight and they served their specific purposes. I had them as backups and I strapped them all together. And actually that's not the best way to move multiple fly rods, but I'll talk about the best way to move multiple fly rods at the end of the episode, the very end of the episode in the episode recommendations, which actually another caveat, if you never listen to the very end of the podcast, uh, after I start talking about what's been on the website the last few days, I always have a recommendation of a product or a website or a video or a book. So make sure you stay tuned to the the end of the podcast for that. But when you go on a fishing trip, you can carry as many fly rods as you can fit in your car, as many fly rods as you can fit in the boat, as many fly rods as you can fit in the plane, whatever that looks like. And when you're on a family trip, that's not always the case. You have to be very discerning. So I'm going down to Virginia. That's our trip. That's where if you've been listening and reading for a long time, you know that I've lived there recently and it's where I kind of grew up. And as excited as I am about potentially getting away for the better part of a day or even just half of a day to go chase uh, smallmouth in the river or trout in the mountains, I'm almost as excited about fishing for just whatever is living in the subdivision ponds around where my in-laws live. That is kind of where I learned to fish back when I was an early teenager is these northern Virginia suburban ponds catching everything and anything that swims in these in these places. But I also absolutely love chasing panfish with a fly rod. And I talked about that last week and just it's it's a lot of fun and doing it in these nicely manicured suburban ponds is a real treat because there's nothing around you. Again, it's probably not the best thing to have these ponds that are mowed right up to the, the the bank, but it really does help in the casting and for the casting for the eight and the five-year-old. So what I'm going to do, knowing that I might get into trout, but more likely than not, I'm going to be fishing for smaller bass and panfish, is I'm going to bring a six weight. Now, is the six weight going to be overkill for the trout if I get into the trout? Yes, but that's okay. I'm not going on a fishing trip. I'm going to enjoy every moment of getting away that uh, that I can, even if I'm a little bit overgunned for what I'm going up against. So that's part of the, the equation. Maybe the first thing that you need to think about is what is my target species? So if you're going somewhere where you know exactly what you're fishing for, you have this planned out. You're going to Denver for a conference or for family, and you know you're going to have one day on the rivers, maybe in Rocky Mountain National Park. Then bring that eight and a half foot four weight because that's going to be perfect on those creeks. You know that you're going down to Miami for a business trip, and you're going to be able to fish in the canals. Then, you know, bring that eight weight because you're going to be casting larger flies to peacocks and to whatever else lives there. You're going to go and just so on and so forth. You might have it dialed in, but if you're going and you really don't know what's going to happen or you're traveling cross country, we did this recently where I fished in multiple spots as we moved across country, then find something that's going to kind of hit in the middle. There's a chance I'm going to be up against some grass carp next week and I don't like the idea of tangling with a large one on a six weight. Is it doable? Yes. Is it ideal? No. I like to have my eight weight for these giant dino fish, but I'm not going to bring an eight weight just in case I run into some grass carp. I'm going to bring something that splits the difference between really big bass, really big bass flies, and small brook trout on mountain streams. That six weight is going to do it. So if you can only fit one rod, find that perfect medium kind of middle ground situation. Now, let's also be realistic. Fly rods don't take up a lot of space. So if you're not 
uh, infringing on other stuff. And for us, it's like the big Yeti cooler full of all the food we don't want to go bad. And this person needs almond milk and the baby needs the yogurt and all those things. We have a lot of stuff that has to go in the back and then the stroller and then the scooters have to go. And so there's a lot of things. So a second fly rod actually does start to look and feel a little bit uh, looming and ominous in, in all that packing. But if you have a car topper, like we also may employ, or you have the stow and go seat in the minivan, which my goodness, I think I've talked about how great minivans are in, in the podcast before, but it, you can just fit so much stuff. So I don't think I'm even going to be in the situation where I'm going to need one, only one rod. So what I'll probably do, and I know that I'm kind of going back on what I just said, is I'll bring that six weight that I'll use primarily, but I'll bring a three weight and a four weight for my boys because they're probably only going to tangle with panfish on small poppers and little dry flies. So that way I'll have a three weight if I go up to the mountains and that look at everyone's happy. And so as long as you can fit it in there, you can bring it. But if you are flying, that's probably not going to be the case, especially if you're flying with kids. That is going to be a real premium of, of what you can fit. So again, the, the one fly rod thing is, holds true for those situations. Reels, you know, you bring your reel. You don't have to get fancy about that. Line, tip it, flies. Hopefully you have a leader wallet. You know, a leader wallet is really, really important because I remember there was a time before I started carrying a leader wallet where I just wanted to always make sure I had one or two extra leaders and little envelopes somewhere on me. And more often than not, I would forget or what I would do, and you've probably had this happen too, is you have a, a leader and and I've talked about this before where I like to start off the season with a uh, knotless, tapered, mono or fluorocarbon leader and then I make alterations to it. Well, there was a time where, you know, I'd have one of these in my bag and either because I needed to put a new leader on because of the beginning of the season or because I had a just an epic tangle, I would take it out, put the new leader on, slide that, that envelope back in my vest or in my sling pack, and then forget that it's empty. And so the next time I look in there, I say, oh, look, at well, I've got one. Well, then I didn't have one, so I have to leave the stream, go to the fly shop, buy another one. You have a leader wallet, and you have all of your backup leaders in there. You make sure they're clearly labeled. And then you also have, like, your poly leaders, your sinking uh, heads for your, your fly line that you keep in there also. And so that just goes with you wherever you go. And maybe you want to have two leader wallets. But that's a great thing to just make sure it fits in. It's the, it's small. It, it's it doesn't mess with anything as far as space goes. So make sure you have those and then your tippet. I'm of the mind that it's okay to bring the bar with the three, four, five, six, seven all on it. It doesn't take up that much more space. Now flies, 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 flies. I like to travel lightly with flies because one, that gives me an excuse to go to a fly shop. Two, I know what I'm going to use. And I've talked about this as recently as the last podcast. If I have five boxes of flies, I know which two or three patterns I'm going to turn to. And if I'm not going to be fishing for a prolonged period of time, if this is maybe a couple hours, a couple days, uh, maybe even just a half a day, I'm going to definitely only turn to those patterns that I have confidence in. Might I get there and realize, oh, there's a hatch, or this is happening, or the water's really high, and so I need bigger, brighter, flashier, or whatever. Yes, and if that happens, then I say, oh, I need to go to the fly shop real fast. And I have a great excuse to go to the fly shop. But I'm not bringing box after box after box after box of flies. Again, if you have the space, then bring more than what you need. But honestly, if you're only fishing for a little bit, then you know what you're going to use. So this is a great exercise in minimalism. Figure out your confidence flies. Have a box of just those flies. Bring them on these trips. Bring them on vacation. You're going to find that this is the fly box, if you use it frequently, that you're going to turn to over and over and over again. It's a lot of fun to have dozens of fly boxes, but it's also a lot of fun to have one fly box that you know is going to work more often than not. Rod, reel, line, leaders, flies, tools. So here's where I, this is, this is my, my thing. I, I have my sling pack and I want everything to fit inside of it. It might get all dangly and lanyarded and clipped and zingered to the outside once I'm fishing. But as I'm moving around, as I'm throwing this in the back with all of our other gear, or I'm throwing it in my luggage, I want my forceps that have scissors on them and my nippers that have my uh, um, hook eye cleaner and all those little dangly things. I want them inside so they're not rubbing up against other stuff and they're not getting pulled and, and, and jerked against things. So I really just do nippers, 
forceps, and weight, and floats. And that's it. And one pack of each. I pick my favorite floats, and I stick with those. It's usually pulses. I know they're not eco-friendly, but um, I, I like the way that pulses work, and I don't have to fuss with them, and I don't. that way I don't throw like two or three thingamabobbers in there, and the right one or the one that I want to use end up losing the top to it or gets cracked. If I have a whole little sleeve of pulses, those little sticky foam indicators, then I know that I'm golden. And then the weight, the same thing. Just make sure you have enough. Uh, it's one thing to go to the fly shop to buy flies. It's another thing to go to the fly shop to buy uh, weight. That's just frustrating. So make sure it's got what you what you want in it. And then pick the right size bag. A nice little hip pack, a nice little chest pack, a nice little sling pack. I use the Vitavu Tightline Sling for these situations because it's very unobtrusive, very uh, comfortable, and it is not going to take up a lot of space in my bag, and it forces me to pack light. And I'm never without what I need, and I'm rarely without what I want when I use a bag this size. Okay, so the next things to consider is make sure you bring your sunglasses. People always forget sunglasses. I have three pairs of fishing sunglasses that I keep in my car. That's not going to do me any good when I'm in my van 500 miles away. So remember to pack the best fishing glasses that you want to bring. Remember to pack your hat. Don't just pack the hat that you want to wear when you're out and about, but a hat that you don't mind fishing in and getting some floating on it. Oh, I forgot to mention floating. Don't forget floating. But uh, make sure you bring that also. And then, uh, actually real quick, let me talk about that. All of my fishing hats, they have a stained spot right over my right eye on the brim because, for whatever reason, that is the point that I have always rubbed my fingers after I have applied float to a fly. I have always rubbed the brim of my hat, and I didn't realize why I have stains on the brim of my hat and all of my fishing hats until recently when I caught myself rubbing floatant on the brim of my hat. And it's this little off white little patch on the top and the bottom, thumb and forefinger of all of my fishing hats. Check to see if your fishing hats have that too. You might have some spot where, or maybe you're just more hygienic than me and you actually you know, clean yourself. But next thing would be waders, I suppose. Now, if you're going somewhere to do waist deep fishing on a big river then you're gonna have to bring your waders and your boots and there's no way around that but if you're fishing in the in nicer weather and you can get away with wet wading then that is where a pair of lightweight wading boots is really going to come in handy because chances are if they're lightweight they don't have a lot of structure and if they don't have a lot of structure then they're kind of collapsible and you can smash them somewhere uh, so i have my um astral wading shoes which those are stylish enough. I could wear them in the airport. Uh, and again, stylish isn't the most important, but you're not going to wear wading boots in the airport. I'm sure somebody has before. Um, and, and those would work, but if you need a little bit more support, like I've got my ultra light Reddington Benchmark boots. Awesome boots. They offer good support in the foot and the ankle, but the shank, the, the part that goes up towards your, 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 um, your calf, they can compress. So really you're only talking about the space of the toe box and kind of the ankle cup. The rest of it can smash down. Then I've got like my my corkers, which they are super heavy duty and rigid, and they would not be my choice for a trip like this. Those are my fishing trip boots, but they're not going to be my boots that I take on a, a family trip or if I'm having to fly somewhere. Have a pair of boots or shoes that can kind of collapse down and fit a little bit better, and that dry quickly. That is also very important. I, I can't forget that. You don't want your wet stuff going back into your luggage. It's one thing to be in your fishing bag, but nothing to be in your luggage. I'm sure there's a lot of things. And again, if I miss something integral, like, you know, I fl- thought of floating here a second ago, uh, let me know. Let me know if there's something that I, I forgot and I can add it if uh, I put a post up about this. But something else I like to do is once I get where I'm going, if I'm going to one place, so this week I'll end up at my in-law's house, I'll unpack the van, and I will set up my sling pack. I'll pull everything out from the inside, dangle it from the outside, kind of take inventory. And what I like to do when I do this, and I've mentioned this before, is I will put it on my body and I will say, I'll look down, I'll say, what am I missing? And if I'm missing something, I would rather anticipate and proactively say, oh, hey, if you're running by, you know, wherever, swing into the the, the sporting goods store and please get me a pair of hemostats or, or whatever. Or I don't have some floating. Uh, there's an Orvis store here in town. I'm going to go and, and, and grab some floating. 
Whatever that may be, it's great to, to say, this is what I forgot before you want to go out on the water. Because again, if these are small intervals of, of being able to fish, you fishing in that median time, uh, the, the, little, the little chunks between this and that family activity, you don't want to realize that you don't have any leaders. You grabbed a reel that doesn't have a leader on it, and you thought you were saving space by not throwing your leader wallet into your vest, and you can't fish. I mean, I'm sure you could tie a woolly bugger on the end of your, your fly line and maybe catch something, but you can't fish without it. And so it's good to know that beforehand. So I always like to take inventory as soon as I get where I'm going. This is true for little family trips. This is true if I am flying somewhere for business. This is true if I'm going on a fishing trip. I always want to know beforehand, so I'm not surprised. Um, bug spray and sunscreen. Don't forget bug spray and sunscreen. But usually that stuff kind of follows you, especially if you're going uh, someplace with other people. Any travel tips that you have? Rolling your socks into balls and not folding your shirts, but uh, rolling them into tubes? I don't know. Whatever you think is very pertinent for me and for the rest of those who listen to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast, please let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. And I hope that you are able to get away. And if you are able to get away with your family, they are able to fish for a few hours here and there and just add a little something to your family trip, a.k.a. vacation. This week on Casting Across, the first article is called The Bad Day Eraser. The Bad Day Eraser. And uh, I'll give you a hint as to what it is. It's small. It swims in virtually every pond in the United States. And it will eagerly take a little hard-bodied popper. But uh, if you've had a bad day and there's a pond between work and home, or there's a pond that you can drive to before it gets too dark after you put the kids to bed, then these little fish will help wash away the difficulties of the day. Second article this week is called Fun in Spite of the Sun. I'm not a fan of the sun. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm hoping it doesn't burn itself up anytime in the near future, but I don't like sunburn, and I feel like I get much hotter if I have um, short sleeves and the sun's beating down on my arms or maybe exposed like shoulder or you know, like the, the back of my neck than if I am very bundled up in the summertime. So I wear long sleeve shirts with either big collars or hoods as much as I can when I'm on the stream, when I'm at the beach. I don't care how I look. I want to be comfortable, and I'm more comfortable when I'm like that because I also don't like sunscreen. But in this article, I talk about five things that I do to stay not just comfortable but safe when I'm out in the sun. Nothing too revolutionary, but things that might be worth integrating if you also want to be conscious of limiting your sun exposure. This week's recommendation on casting across. I alluded to it earlier. I know I've talked about it numerous times on the podcast before. But it's worth mentioning again that if you are traveling, you should absolutely check out the Rod Quiver from VitaVu. The Rod Quiver from VitaVu is a great way to carry multiple fly rods. So you can put four rods into it, and there is three, there are three models. One is four, it's for the purpose of four, four four-piece rods up to 10 feet long. There's another one that's specifically designed for fiberglass rods because it is built to accommodate four three-piece rods up to eight and a half feet long. Then there's a spay model, which is four four four-piece rods up to 13 and a half feet long. So it's kind of hard to describe over a podcast. You just go to vitavu.com and check out the rod quiver. But it's basically a bunch of rod socks that are side by side to accommodate four fly rods. So you have 16 pieces or uh, 12 if you're talking about the fiberglass uh, model, and they are then backed up against a PVC-coated nylon. And so you have some support and some rigidity there, but you have then two options of how to fold this thing up. Uh, One is to roll it. So at that point, you have this shell surrounding these 16 pieces of rod blank. It's incredibly heavy duty at this point you're not going to break a rod under virtually all circumstances. And it fits on almost all carry-on situations, and it's something that you can put a lot of rods in and throw in the back of your car or in your stow-and-go or in your trunk, and it's going to keep all of your rods secure, and you're not going to have to deal with a bunch of rods that are in tubes and that are bouncing around. But you can roll it or you can fold it so it can be flat, so it can be a, a different packing 
you know, system, if you're doing the whole Tetris thing, it can just fold over. So you kind of have a, a row of, uh, of eight and then another row of eight. But it's a really cool product. It, it does come in around $200. But again, if you are protecting at this point, you know, four moderately priced fly rods, you're talking something like well over $1,000. So this is just a great way to consolidate your packing. You don't have rod tubes rolling all over the place. And uh, I've tried all those systems of like strapping rod tubes together and they work okay, but things slide around and it's not perfect. This is a great solution. And as with everything else with Vitavu, handmade in the United States to order incredibly fun and convenient and well thought out product. Vitavu.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com where you'll find more info on this podcast and three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. Mm-hmm.